All right, cool. Um, so yeah, we're going to be talking about the criminalization of poverty and homelessness. Um, my name is Peyton. I am founder of the Black Knowledge Coalition. Um, and today I'm here with Gaurav representing Ward 2 Mutual Aid. Um, so yay, yeah, Gaurav, yay, Ward 2 Mutual Aid. Um, <laughs> so just a little bit about who we are, what we do. Um, we are a education mutual aid network. Um, we are fueled by Black folk, Black people, and our focus is to take information that is usually found in higher education or institutions with access and redistributing that information and making it more available to just anyone who needs it. Um, but specifically with the focus on the Black radical tradition um, and just revolutionary thought in general. But we're not limited to people who are in higher education because we believe that not only people who have access to institutions know everything, that is just simply not true. Um, so we'll lean on everyone in our community, including y'all who have information and knowledge and wisdom from other ways to still apply to the conversation that we are having. Um, these are just our teams. So we have like our admin team, um, which oversees all of our organizational operations, our online and in-person education team. So in-person is like this and online. Um, we have like online discussions or printed out literature, texts, other things we'll do for online education. And then social media and outreach, um, pretty self-explanatory social media. So if y'all are really interested in any of those things, so we have to work on. All right, so this like some expectations in the general flow of this conversation. Um, again, this is a communal mutual aid based education space. So me and Gore are gonna be giving y'all the information, but like we said, like we don't know everything. And if there's something that y'all have to contribute, please do, um, please tell us, because we can only learn if we teach each other. Um, be mindful of who is speaking, so that includes yourself. Um, if you like, feel like you've been saying a lot, let me know, or not let us know, but like let someone else speak, um, you know, the vibes. And then, just more formal education does not mean that you know more than another person. Um, like we were saying earlier, just because you've gone to a more formal institution does not mean that you should be able to speak over someone else or not and allow someone else to share their own experience and their knowledge. Um, and then again, listen by reflecting um, as you are, you know, navigating this conversation. Um, you know, from like where people come in, if um, people have to go, just listen um, by listen first by. Uh, reflecting how you move and interact, not just in this space, but like all spaces as it applies to this topic. Okay. All right. So just the basics of everything. So like, what is criminalization? What does that mean? So the criminaliza criminalization is like, as we're defining it in this context, is the placement of some criminal personhood onto a specific group of people or persons. And that criminalization can be applied and understood in many ways in many contexts, but it's basically understanding that this person, these people are inherently criminal in some way. Um, and it's based on power dynamics, which is very important to understand um, who makes the rules. So the people who hold power in a certain situation are the ones who have the ability to criminalize other people. Um, and so just going to look what it means to experience homelessness, a person who has experienced homelessness, we're defining it as anyone who is living in a space that is not intended for human habitation. Um, they're currently in an emergency shelter of any kind, in transitional housing, or they're exiting an institution where they were supposed to be temporarily residing, but are leaving it. It's basically anyone who is not for sure have somewhere inside of a shelter, inside of a home, um, a physical domain to be. Um, surveillance, so the idea of surveillance it is the monitoring of a population that is carried out by either a local or federal entity, and it usually is in service of some sort of power dynamic that we discussed earlier. Um, the carceral state, so the carceral state are institutions that use state power to exert violence on or um, captivate oppressed peoples or um, and just control them and contain them in some way. Um, so the carceral state, we'll be touching on that a little bit later on. But those are just a few definitions that are helpful for as we go through this conversation. Um, and as of January 2020, so keep in mind these statistics, a lot of the information that we found were pre-COVID and COVID like increasingly, like or drastically increased the number of people who are experiencing homelessness. So I would take this information and I would tack on like a few more percents, like a few thousand more, just because there, because of COVID, there has been an issue with collecting the data just because more people have been moving around, people have been displaced, but also just like for safety reasons. 
Um, but so this is all as of January 2020. So in the US, 580,466 people were experiencing homelessness. Um, 6,380 of those were in DC, 61% were male. Um, we were we found an underwhelming amount of information on trans and gender non-conforming people experiencing homelessness because the information that we were able to find was like, oh, it's like 13%. And I'm like, there's no, it has to be way higher than that. Like that's just, it's just unbelievable. That's only 13 um, percent nationwide. That's just not making any sense. Um, and so again, keep in mind that caveat. We just, even as we are finding, looking for information to share, just like the biases that exist, just as we're looking for information in general. Um, and then a growing population of people experiencing homelessness um, is over the age of 65 as well. So there's a large amount of seniors who are experiencing homelessness. Um, okay, so those are just like the basics. So like, what would, what incentive does the state have to criminalize people experiencing homelessness and people in poverty? And so like what thinking would encouraging that criminalization to occur? And so do you wanna to go to this quote? Yeah, sure. sure. So uh, the reason why I thought it was a good idea to include this is because it's like, well, it's wrong. First of all, like what they're saying is just incorrect, but it is the type of reasoning that's used to justify um, the criminalization of homeless populations. So you can see here like, the urban environment is being undermined by the presence. So like somehow it's kind of like treating them not as like people, but just like some sort of like growth that needs to be getting rid of. And then the second part is like, this is the part that is um, more commonly used. Like you always hear people saying that like, we need to criminalize this because we're trying to help these people out because otherwise they're just gonna wanna like continue to stay homeless, um, which um, you're gonna see throughout the rest of this presentation that not only is this wrong, but also it's actually doing the exact opposite of what they're saying, right? Like the criminalization actually exacerbates the homelessness um, and it makes it harder for people to exit it. Um, but I do think it was important to sort of include the reasoning um, just so you can see why it's wrong. Yeah, thank you. A lot of basically the, the reason is that like, oh, think of, we're going to go into a little bit later, the idea of it's called... Um, implicit consent, and we're gonna get more into it later, but it's the idea that like, because people experiencing poverty, people who are unhoused are here, instead of thinking of what they need to get out of those circumstances, what institutional, you know, things led up to that point, it's like, oh, it's time to hide and contain. So there, again, the, think of the, the language, pay attention to that, when homeless people are allowed to conduct daily acts of living, like, how are you going to allow another human being? Say who and who out? Who else cannot exist in a space without a person? You know what I mean? And this is a very common, like generally, like they genuinely believe that this is the way to approach issues um, of homelessness and poverty. And so it's not seen as like, a human rights issue to address. It seems as like a social like eyesore, a social problem, a pest, or a, a, something that is uh, bothering other people, and that allows them that thinking allows. Um, state officials to remove the blame from the institutions and onto the individual. Like, well, what are they doing to get them into that position? Yeah, so this quote is like, I really like this quote again to illustrate what was going on. So this is um, from an article that was actually earlier this year. And um, they're talking about, uh, when they talk about the tents, they're talking about the East Street encampment. Um, and essentially um, the Federal Reserve Chair, Jerome Powell, he always drives past it on the way to work. So um, I'll just read out this quote, just in case. The people living in those tents had no idea that their burgeoning village kept this man, Jerome Powell, up at night, or that he kept thinking about them as he drove two blocks south to his office. Powell doesn't know their names or backstories either, but what he saw was clear, a visceral reminder of the uneven economic recovery right there in the Fed's shadow. So what I wanna point out here is like, look at how the script is flipped. Like the people, in the encampment are somehow harming the chair of the Federal Reserve by keeping him up at night, right? So suddenly now they're the instigators. And then the second part of it is like a visceral reminder of the uneven economic recovery, like so passive, like, oh, where, where did this recovery come from? It fell from a tree or something. It couldn't have had anything to do with the guy who's in charge of the economy. Like it, it clearly, the way that it, the way that it misdirects, you know, what's actually going on and reassigns blame. I just thought this was like a really good example of that. And this was in a New York Times yeah, article. New York Times article. This was fully published. And the, the whole article 
it's again it frames it as like oh like pours your own power like I'm just like you feel so bad that he has to like every time he drives into work he has to see these like homeless people like oh like we're we couldn't imagine what that's like you know what I'm like that and it's the genuine like again implicit consent and so going off of that into community complacency and so when we're thinking about criminalization it is carried out and facilitated by the state but it is with the aid of people who are part of these communities and who are living in the communities where a lot of unhoused people live, especially with bigger encampments. And so I mentioned implicit consent earlier. It's um, something that came that Angela Davis came up with um, in her book, Are Prisons Obsolete? Um, it's understood, she frames it in the context of the prison industrial complex, but it can be applied to any anything. Well, everything is related to the prison industrial complex. But um, so implicit consent is based on Americans' assumption that isolating and punishing bad actors, whatever they may think a bad actor look like, um, is inher inherently makes the world a safer place, the free world a safer place. So it's saying that because you are bad, because you are having some social issue, some thing is wrong with you, take you, isolate you, get you outside. And implicit consent is building off the idea that in like our American polity and our American society at large, everyone is kind of socialized with that understanding. Um, and so in the context of homelessness and poverty, this means forcing people who are experiencing these conditions out of the public eye. And so an example of this, it's not a DC based example, but Skid Row, a lot of everyone is familiar with Skid Row. Um, they're, they force, they literally, you cannot, like if, if you try, you cannot. And so that's an example where the city or the county would take everyone who's experiencing poverty, homelessness and just, shove them away and put them away so we don't have to look at them, we don't have to deal with them. We have to address those, those concerns as they are um, coming from an institutional place. And so these are just some, um, some stats we found to kind of illustrate the way that the public will view uh, homelessness and people who are experiencing homelessness. These aren't the worst, uh, just to spare you all the anger. <laughs> um, we didn't include all of them, but this is um, based on a study published in the Journal of Human Psychology. So People will believe that homelessness is intrinsically caused by irresponsibility by the individual. 62% of people believe that, or laziness, 41% of people. 74% of people feel less compassion for the homeless than, than they used to. 56.7% um, are careful not to touch a homeless person. I guess you'll catch their homelessness, I don't know. Um, only 49% of people believe that homeless people should be allowed, again, language are to be allowed to set up tents or shelter in public parks or public areas. Um, and again, this was again like a pre-COVID survey. So like who could even know how these public perceptions have been impacted since then. Um, and so like when the public is viewing homelessness in the same way as the state, it allows the state to justify their violent actions, whether that can be an eviction, a cleanup, just the criminalization at law at large. Um, it allows them to justify it, but like, oh, well, this is what the public wants. Like we're following the, the rule, the will of the people. And so those, and usually that those people are usually um, wealthy stakeholders, whatever in that constituency in that, in that district, whatever it may be. Um, but thinking about how the state reflects or how the state actually criminalizes people, that is not, that does not come out of nowhere. You know? Like it's, it allows, it's allowed to carry out by people in these communities who are regularly interacting with people who are unhoused, whether it be in an encampment, whether it just be if they see them like out on the street, you know what I mean? Their mindset, how they react to them, it does not exist in a vacuum and it actually has real consequences. And so communities are responsible for the well being of their unhoused neighbors, whether that is to support them or whether that is to further dig them into deeper into their conditions. So I'm a material example of that. Yeah, so another example from DC to illustrate what Peyton was just talking about. Um, so Burke Park, um, it's a park that was at 16th, uh, still, the park is still there, at 16th and Mass. Um, and it was surrounded, or still is, I guess, surrounded by condo buildings, expensive apartments. And so essentially people from the buildings just started complaining about the people in the encampment. There are about, I think, 12 to 15 people who are living there. Um, like the complaints were just outrageous. Like I won't repeat them. They don't deserve that kind of respect. But like eventually that um, exactly like Peyton was saying, this got, um, you know, the police involved. And because um, this was a national memorial or some sort of, you know, like national, I don't know, monument, 
um, it falls under the jurisdiction of the federal parks police as opposed to MPD. And MPD does have certain restrictions to where they can't just come and clear out an encampment. Uh, they have to provide notice or like some sort of justification. The federal parks police had no such uh, restrictions. So they essentially were um, halted for a while because of work that like War II Mutual Aid and other organizations did. Um, but eventually they just came and evicted everyone. And so I think this is just like exactly like play for play how the police protect interests of a particular class of people. Because it's not like, it, it can seem like bewildering, like why would you just get rid of people who are living? But the interests of the people who are in those expensive buildings was clearly to, you know, like not have these people around, not be reminded of how they might be complicit. Um, and so the police was more than happy to protect their interests at the expense of the unhoused population. Yeah, when did this happen? This happened over the summer. I want to say in July. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It happened very quickly. But very another quickly. interesting, with that phenomenon is it blew up very quickly in terms of just like people, the public desire to get involved in the help, which is great, right? Like as a lot of mutual aid organizers were like organizing, some of which are in this room, were organizing around like trying to actually stop this. How many populations of people who were in the class that are protected by police all of a sudden engage, all of a sudden became active. And so an important thing to note there is like paying attention to who is willing to mobilize in protection of their unhoused neighbors when it's like socially acceptable versus who will do it just because it's what we need to be doing. Um, and I think Burke Park was a, was a great example of that. Okay, so kind of going um, more on police. Again, police will protect the the um, desires and the will of a certain class um, and use that as a way to criminalize unhoused people and people in poverty. And so in a survey of 351 unhoused residents in San Francisco. Um, yeah, so uh, I, like basically the main thing here is like the disparity between like almost all of them were approached by police, asked to move, uh, they had their belongings taken, almost 40% had their belongings destroyed, and then like less than 10% were actually offered, even offered any help. Like, and most of the time when they were, it was literally just like, here's a pamphlet, figure it out. Um, and when they were asked to move, only 9% were ever like asked uh, or were ever provided help to go to a shelter. And then the same thing happened um, in Denver. And this is actually, I thought this was very relevant because DC is also uh, going through a camping ban right now and they're trying to clear out all the encampments. And so, Essentially, it's just even worse than it was in the San Francisco example. 90% contacted by the police and displaced. 70% um, were just checked for arrest warrants. You know, they just assumed that they were had an arrest warrant against them. And over half of them were harassed by the police over five times. Um, and then again, the same story when it comes to actually helping them. Only 10% were offered any services and um, any outreach worker was only contacted less than 5% of the time. So essentially like this, uh, if you remember the justification that was being provided earlier about why we need to criminalize because, you know, we're gonna like help people out and so on, it doesn't play out whatsoever. And it just usually leads to them being displaced and harassed. And, with, and within Ward 2 Mutual Aid, we see that a lot. We've been getting a lot of reports of people who, are, who live in the encampments. M MPD will just come up, take their stuff, throw it away, and like get out. And that that is not random, that is not, you know, just a, a random coincidence is happening. You know, it's intentional and it is it is an act of violence every single time. And so it begs the question, like, they don't do this just nowhere, like there are people around, like who in these communities bring us the idea of community complacency. Like when you see unhoused people being harassed by MPD being surveilled, is it, it's in our implicit consent. It's the way that we've been socialized to see that and be like, oh, that's just normal. That's expected. They probably did something. They're probably, yeah, drug drama, like whatever. The, I, the whole drugs and weapons thing um, with Burke Park, the, the people who live in the condos around them, like, oh, they're selling guns and they'll create, and a part of that criminalization is just the creation of crimes that are simply just not happening. And so when you're, but when you're in a position of, of less power, um, when you are being harassed by the state, what are you going to say? Like, what defense can you have? And so that's where the idea of community, that, that's where the idea of like power members comes in because we really have to like look out for each other in that way. Okay, social services. So we talked about how a lot of these like 
neoliberal, like fake, helpful initiatives around um, people in, in encampments can play out. And a big um, motivation for that is the idea of coercive care. Um, this kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier about what would make the state like want to criminalize people in these conditions. And it's that idea that people need a specific catalyst or a motivation to move into shelters and receive services. That unless we give them a push, they're not gonna wanna go. Now, is it asking the question of why they would wanna go? No, it is not. Um, it is just like, well, there, it must be their issue. They just don't wanna go to shelters. They just don't wanna re receive help. And so coercive care comes in and it's, the catalyst is usually not of the consent of the people in those conditions. Um, that catalyst can be a, a cleanup of an encampment, of this create eviction of an encampment. It could even be social services coming in and be like, you're going to the shelter today. Like, then you have to leave your things, you have to leave your home, you have to leave all your belongings because you're going. Um, and so people who are experiencing homelessness, they will report that social services and all these ideas of health and what will help them are based off of middle class and upper class perception of what they need and not like the actual solutions to their conditions and their issues. It is not reflective of things that are actually going to be helpful and are frankly grounded in a place of privilege where it's like, oh, well, just like go apply for a job. Don't ask if they have a phone, phone number do that. You usually need address to apply for most jobs, right? Like if they have reliable internet or connection, do the training for the job that they're just going to go apply to. Do they have the money to get the uniform for the job? That is a few things that a few um, of our unhoused neighbors in Works Beach Lane have reached out to us asking for like, it can be like $50 to just get the uniform to get the job. And if they don't get the uniform, they can't have the job. And like things like that. So usually people who are in these conditions are like, yeah, social services, these people are coming in to help us, but they're it's not grounded in the right place. They're not asking them or telling them what they need. Um, and so right to housing laws expand kind of work in favor of this. And they also are a tool to expand police power. So right to housing law, do you want to explain right to housing law? Yeah, so essentially like uh, certain places like New York City is the most prominent example I can think of is they have uh, what's called right to shelter or right to housing. And they have to essentially have uh, the same amount of spots or beds in a shelter as there is an unhoused population at the same time. Um, but first of all, um, you know, like the shelters are pretty terrible places to actually live for longer than even like a few weeks. That's why so many people choose to have encampments because it's far nicer to live outside. Like you don't have to get rid of your pet. You, you know, there's not bugs everywhere. Um, it's easier to access bathrooms. Uh, especially for women, like this, uh, uh, like they get harassed a lot or assaulted, for example, in shelters, very common. Um, so uh, basically what it does is like in New York City, it, that usually like cops will just come and like force you to go to a shelter without any assistance. And all that ends up actually doing is just displacing you from wherever you were and you have to find another spot now. Um, so even when there is a right to shelter law, it still usually leads to something terrible happening. And a lot of these laws are, are set up in a way, especially like New York, like we, like a lot of people are familiar with how just gross NYPD's abuses in New York, especially just in, at large, but specifically about house population of homeless people. And so these right to shelter laws are opportunities to expand police power by, as they're going through encampments and surveilling people, they can funnel unhoused people into the, either the criminal justice system or the shelter, the criminal justice system via shelters, right? And so they'll have greater access also to shelter resources. It is not uncommon to, for there to be a heavy police presence just outside of shelters, just, just waiting, just post it up, right? And then police can also use this, um, use this power to criminalize unhoused folks under the guise of mental health. So imagine they're going to an encampment, like, oh, we're gonna be escorting all of you to a shelter, da 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 da. We're in DC, right? Um, it's not unheard of for people to like smoke weed just out. And people do it, everyone does it, you know what I mean? But if you're at an encampment, that is an opportunity for that MPD officer to use that to criminalize this person and then da 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 da. Um, and so shelters, like Gord was saying, are used as a solution to sanitize our communities and going back to the idea of implicit consent. Uh, it is not an uncommon, like what you were kind of taught, like stop, drop and roll when you catch on fire. The other thing you're taught is like, oh, see uh, someone who's homeless, just tell them to go to a shelter, right? It's kind of in that, that knee jerk reaction to like, uh, how do I help you just send them to a shelter, right? 
And so they're used as a solution to sanitize and to contain people instead of a place to like actually turn this into permanent housing. And a lot of shelters will focus on like one year, getting you a one year lease. Like, no, because then in a year, guess where they end up again? Permanent housing, permanent. And that's the thing that um, we're going to talk about it in a second. But with us, a lot of these evictions that are taking place, encampment evictions throughout the city, that's a lot of the demands of people who are in the encampments. Like, I don't want social services to set me up with a year lease. I need them to set me up with permanent housing because I'm just going to be back here and here. Um, and so anti-homeless laws and initiatives in general are enforced, even though there may be a wait list for, for either resources, shelters, housing vouchers. So these right to housing and right to shelter laws will be enforced whether or not they're going to be going straight to housing or not. Like, well, we set you up with the resources. We gave you a pamphlet. We told you where to go. Good luck. Like, and so that is, that is the mindset that these laws are enforced under. And like Gore was saying, Many shelters are just inhabitable. No one should be living there. Either whether they have terrible resources, ter beds at all, mattresses on the floor in many cases, um, they're dangerous for women. They experience various types of abuse and violence there. And they're just unsanitary. Like people will be getting sick, especially during COVID. Like it was, it was a scary place. And so you can't blame someone who is unhoused for being like, I don't want to go there. Like I'm safer here. I feel this is this is where I all oh my this is where I am. You know what I mean? And so going on from yes, into our uh, beloved uh, mayor Um <laughs> in August, you see a, a quietly, like softly announced um the encampment pilots for initiative where they will have the goal of removing three of the largest encampments across DC. And they already started with the one in Noma. Um, I don't know if y'all heard, but they actually struck someone with a bulldozer who's still in their tent. Um, you can read into that, you can get angry about it, because I, <laughs> woo child. Um, and right now they're in the process of, soon, still don't know um, when that's gonna start with the encampment on East Street and 20th Street. And then the final one is New Jersey and Oak Street. And so, the dates of these evictions are inconsistent and unreliable. For the E Street, we've heard October 15th, October 22nd. At one point, it was like September 30th. Like, no one is getting any real answers. One, because the public pressure is there, the community pressure is there. They're seeing now that the commu not communities will not just be complacent in the violent eviction of their, of their neighbors. And so as that is, as that pressure is increasing, so is their, so are, they're getting more and more nervous. And so, so is the inability to give like real answers and real information. And so like Gord mentioned earlier that um, MP has to give two weeks um, notice for if they're gonna, the National Park Service don't have to do that. They can just show up and just take all their stuff, throw it away and say, get out. And so that is a fear that we have with the upcoming E Street um, encampment eviction is that they'll just show up and, and just get rid of everyone's stuff with no notice at all. And because it's technically, they're technically allowed to do that. Um, even though there is like written record of them saying they're gonna give two week notice. <laughs> when is, again, when is the police, when is the state ever protected the interest of anyone who's not in, in an in a upper class? And so the initiative is intended to put people who are living in the encampments in housing or in contact with social services. Again, just in contact, not paying attention to the language. And this is, I pulled this from like their like one pager on this that they have. Um, and so issues with this, the housing voucher wait time is years long. There are people who are living in the East Street encampment who literally just got off the list, list and it's been years. And so they're putting people on those lists thinking, again, we we're saying housing, unhoused people will report that it's coming from a middle-class mindset. Like, oh, we'll just put you on the housing voucher list. You'll get a car, right? Cool. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to head out. Like, that's the mindset they're coming at it with. Um, police and social services are also being used to surveil and camera the residents because of this. Um, and so over uh, the East Street encampment, one of our neighbors was saying that at one point they, they didn't see him, but when they do be around, they're just like hanging around, like never actually really go to talk because again, they're scared of catching the talking. They're scared that something's going to happen. I'm um, going back to the, the perception that um, they don't need, what was what, it was like 50 some percent of people didn't want to touch an unhoused person. So how are they supposed to help set them up to be safe? 
um, than to provide housing. And so third thing is that, oh, oh, that's often overlooked, is that assistance requires documents that not everyone even still has. Like if you need your driver's license, if you need your social security card, your birth certificate, things that not everyone is keeping up with, then they can't even get a lot of these resources. They can't even get access, but that is being overlooked in this initiative and not, and not just in DC, but in other cities as well. And so many residents will end up in shelters or just be forced to other parts of the city with these, with these evictions. Like it's not actually going to do anything except for this displaced. And in the encampment at New Jersey and O, they're building like a water, like a little fountain water park thing where the encampment was. I, I, but that's a part, again priorities, right? Um, not where people need to live and exist safely. No, we need waters, a little fountain park. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. So this is another um, survey that was taken after the camping ban. Um, this is like this organization is like really annoying to look at, but like. <laughs> Basically, like, if you see, um, again, when people are asked if they feel more or less safe, almost all of them are saying either less safe or the same, um, that, uh, oh, I can't this. How, how much are they, like, how much sleep are they losing? Like, almost 90% of them are getting less sleep now. 91% of them um, are, like, not getting access to shelter resources or it's not changing. So essentially what it's saying is, like, after this camping ban was passed, virtually no one was truly materially helped. Um, instead, they were harassed, they get less sleep, they were displaced, um, and they have less access to resources than they did before. Um, and so this is, the, this is a similar, probably almost definitely the same thing will happen in DC after a camping ban is passed. Um, yeah. And just kind of going back to what we were saying about the quote from, um, I'm about to go back to like this quote, from Jerome Powell. When you like read the like the city of DC's um, website on the eviction initiative, it's the first like paragraph is like, for years, Mayor Bowser has like dreamt of coming up with a plan. Like again, it positions <laughs> them as like the people who are going to be the ones to like save and take all the on house people up from the shadows and put them into a high rise and everything's gonna be great and they're gonna be there forever. No, and so it, takes the blame off of institutions by giving them a pat on the back for like, well, like you acknowledge unhoused people. So like, you're doing a great job. No, 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 okay. Uh, <laughs> this is, I think this is where I want to go. Um, so moving off from, from that into just like the idea of a criminalized class in general. And so very point blank, simple, a criminalized class of people produces a labor force. We are in a capitalist, society. As we were saying earlier, police and institutions will protect the interests of a certain class because that class produces and has stakes in capital. And so, uh, or they control the flow of capital, excuse me. And so the state's goal will always be to protect capital, not people. And um, we're going to provide a couple examples of that in a second. But at the end of the day, that's why they're cleaning out the New Jersey and own encampment to build a little splash park and not to let people live. In service of this idea, institutions will criminalize people and funnel them into the carceral states. Like we were saying with like, like victimless and like low level crimes, usually just like drug offenses or just random stuff. Um, There's so many right, like uh, loitering like crimes, like, cause and then especially it will be tickets, right? So writing them enough tickets and then they can't pay the fines and can't pay the fines if you in jail and then da, da, da. Oh, also, if you remember earlier, like 70% of them, they asked for arrest warrants, so they checked mm -hmm. for arrest warrants. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're going out there to, with the intention to criminalize people. Mm -hmm. Not to provide support, but to like seek out opportunities where they can, where they can be arrested. And so some, there's some called Unicor. Unicor is one of many state-owned corporations that will contract incarcerated laborers out into private corporations. And so according to Unicor's most recent annual report, they employ 17,000 incarcerated workers. They're contracted through them. And they brought in $500 million of annual revenue. And again, this is just one of the corporations that do this. So there is a market for prison labor. And because there's a market, they have to meet that demand somehow. 
and the way which that is done is through the criminalization of people experiencing homelessness and people who are impoverished. They don't have the resources to defend themselves. They don't have the resources to get out of that situation or even to try to just even try, you know what I mean? Okay, so wanna do this? Yeah, so this is just kind of to like wrap it up the whole thing because there was obviously like a lot of different information. Um, so this is just kind of to illustrate like what um, what would happen if you began to experience homelessness and how virtually everything is set up to just, you know, like keep you trapped in that cycle. So like for whatever reason, many people, you know, recently have experienced poverty, for example, and housing insecurity. COVID has led to a lot of people losing their job. Um, and so already, like if you already are in that position, you still might not even be homeless yet. Um, you're going to there's a good chance that you're excluded from a lot of welfare benefits. Um, even if you do get them, they're very insufficient. Um, you have to have a job to get a lot of them. Like I think the largest one is called the earned income tax credit. So you have to earn income um, and so so on and so forth. And then eventually money will run out. You won't be able to pay rent for whatever reason and you'll eventually get evicted. And so once you enter that cycle of homelessness, like we've talked about before, what's most likely to happen is you'll end up settling somewhere at an encampment and then you're gonna inevitably get harassed by the police multiple times. 90% of the time that that happens, they're not gonna actually do anything to help you. They're just going to you know, try and incarcerate you. And then in the you know 10% of cases that you do somehow get helped or you're provided access to these services that are supposed to help you, then you end up in an unhospitable shelter, which you probably won't stay at for long. You get further criminalized, you can get institutionalized. And even if you get like the access to the best you know, outreach workers and social services, eventually that's going to run out too. And so it, it becomes very, very difficult to get out of this cycle because all of these things are connected. Like you need to kind of have a job to get a house. You also need to kind of have a house to get a job um, and so on and so forth. And there's hardly any assistance outside of, you know, what mutual aid can bring to you. And so I think that kind of just like, if you think about it through a hypothetical person and with the context of all the information that we've given you, Criminalization basically makes homelessness inescapable. Okay, and so these are some examples of anti-homeless architecture. Um, these are in DC. The one on the left, is it? Okay. <laughs> Make sure it's y'all left. The one on the left is actually taken on GW's campus outside of the GW hospital, um, which is three blocks from the East Street encampment. And the one on the right, I think that's like the um, but basically those are put there so that and how people can't lay on them, can't sleep on them, can't rest, can't be, can't exist. Um, they're also super ugly and just impractical. <laughs> um, these are the less, I would say, obnoxious examples that exist. There are also many under underpasses, bridges, whatever. There'll be like big spikes and just look weird and just don't be in an awful. Um, and also, wasn't there something that this is more expensive, the money, was it like the mm -hmm. money that you put into like a wreck anti-homeless architecture, you could just use that to put towards resources to stop people from being homeless. But it, it ends up being more expensive, yeah. right? Overall, like I'll, if you, it would be far cheaper to house people than it would to pursue all of these criminalization programs. I think that's been shown in like five different cities. Um, so yeah. Yeah. It also doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. What's up? Um, also, you notice the bus shelter, mm -hmm. like the secret curve, mm -hmm. is very, yeah, it's also there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Love that example. Okay. All right. So we need to give you all a lot of information. Um, quick time check. Let's go. Let's get into it. So we have a couple of questions here. Um, just for y'all to think about, just to kind of get your your views as well. But now we want to hear from y'all, want to hear your thoughts, want to hear anything that you have to offer, even. Um, but they could be based off these questions or things, questions that you were kind of thinking about as we were um, presenting to y'all. So the first one, what do you think is an underlying motive for the criminalization of homelessness and poverty? We kind of already went to the state incentives, but it's we all know there's more than that. And so what, what are you, like, where are you at? Where's your head at with that? Um, and then how can community work together against state entities to protect their unhoused neighbors? So like Laura mentioned mutual aid, 
um, mutual aid is a is a probably the most effective way. Um, you're able to build relationships with your neighbors and see them as you know they are just people who are just in these conditions. Um, connecting with them on a real level, being able to see what they need more intimately instead of just as a social worker. But how can we mobilize outside of just like our small and deeply overworked <laughs> mutual aid network? Um, so yeah, I'm a I'm gonna sit down. And I'm a I'm a leave it to y'all. No one talks. I'm gonna ask people. Ugh. Okay, Leah, 